welcome to my channel if you're new here it's been about a month i think since i made a video and i think that's just gonna be how it is i think i'm gonna be doing monthly videos probably um i am just busy and everything takes about two times as long when you're filming it um but i hope that you guys enjoyed going to the museum going to the museum with me and the conservatory um we finally kind of got out of the house it was so nice um we went to the carnegie museum in pittsburgh um which is an art museum and a natural history museum they're both great and it's like connected so it's it's really fun i mean you could spend probably a whole weekend there if you wanted to um and then we went to the the Phipps Conservatory in Pittsburgh, which I've never been to. So the conservatory was gorgeous. They had so many different like rooms with different um, like ecosystems and things. There were some kind of like weird like wax figure people <laughs> in with this stuff, which I didn't get. Like I would have rather it just have been plants, um, but it was cool. And they had some really neat hanging. Uh, like plant installations um you guys saw like those blue flowers and then there were some that had like various types of ferns and ivies on them which was really cool um so yeah it was really fun i definitely recommend going if you're ever in the pittsburgh area um but that was really nice and um i got an orchid plant um not from the conservatory but from a um a shop called toad flax toad flax and it's this like really beautiful boutique and they have flowers and um they have flowers and like little boutique -y, uh, like specialty items like fancy soaps and perfumes and like linen napkins and stuff like that but i i got a little special treat um which is this orchid i've never had this kind before this is um, it's a dendrobium, and it is a hybrid between two types um, of orchid. And yeah, it I forget its scientific name, but it's called like chocolate chip or something like that because the flowers are like these dark purple spotted. Um, yeah, and unfortunately. The day I got it, I saw a leaf that had like some spots on it, but I just thought that it was like, just like a little bit of damage to that leaf. But over the past few days, there were more and more showing up. And they had told me to keep the orchid like moist, um, like more more wet than my Phalaenopsis. So I was like spritzing it every day. Um, and I think that that might have exacerbated whatever kind of fungus it already had. So I went ahead and I clipped off all of the damaged leaves and it seems to actually be okay now. So we'll see, but I haven't noticed really any more spots. So maybe, maybe one spot <laughs> poking up. I might have to call them and ask about that. But anyway, excited about this. I've like never seen these at any kind of grocery store or anything like that. Um, so I kind of, Alex told me I should jump on the chance to get this special kind of orchid so I did. Um, today I'm going to be sharing with you my process of doing the illustration for my patrons this month of the California ground squirrel. When we lived in California we would go up to San Simeon um, which is kind of near like the Hearst Castle if you've been there um, but we go up to the coast to see the elephant seals and there were these California ground squirrels that lived in the cliff sides like of the ocean and they would come out and they'd just like be looking out at the ocean and then <laughs> they'd go down onto the beach with like these 13 foot elephant seals and they're like these little squirrels and they're just running around so anyway I thought it would be kind of fun to do a an illustration of a California ground squirrel surfer so that is what you guys will see and i also thought that this was a good example of how i do fur that you guys might enjoy a little bit of an explanation on um i mean like you've seen me paint fur before and it kind of varies depending on what animal i'm doing but i thought that this would be a good 
time um, to talk about that. And if you are new here and you're not familiar, um, I have a Skillshare class. Um, I made it a year ago on making your own animal character. It's basically a character design course, um, but it focuses a little bit more on the animal side. You could certainly take it if you want to learn about making people characters too. But, um, but yeah, it's about animals. So the, f how I do my fur is something I didn't really address and that I don't think so. If you watch this and you enjoy it, you can go check that out. I have the link below. And if you use that link, I get $10, <laughs> even though it's free for you. So if you use that and you sign up for like a trial, um, it helps me out and you get a free trial. So that's pretty cool. Um, I am planning on probably doing another Skillshare class. Um, you guys a while ago on Instagram said that you would like a class on clothing, how to draw clothing and textures of clothing and ruffles and things like that. So um, it's one of those things that like I do without thinking about it that much. Not that it hasn't taken practice, but it's always kind of hard to actually formulate how you do something into a class that feels like coherent for someone else to learn from and understand. So um, I've been working on that and now that I've told you <laughs> I need to finish um, so you can keep your eyes out for that because that'll be on Skillshare too and I think it'll be a really good compliment to the animal characters class because um, because in that one I talked about more like the choices that you're going to make for your character, not necessarily how to draw any of the particular things you'd be putting on them. Um, but for this class, I do think that I'm going to be drawing um, clothing on people more so um, because I think that that's going to have like a wider reach. And I actually think that I could make like an entire class just on how to adapt clothing to go on an animal. So I think that I'm just going to keep that separate and let this one be more about the textures and the way that fabric hangs and things like that. And yeah. So anyway, that's, that's some news, but I will go ahead and get on to showing you this process of painting the ground squirrel. Okay, so I'm going to be um, doing this audio recording, but there is someone doing some kind of yard work or construction outside. I really hope that that's not like a distracting sound um, because we lost the headphones that I normally use for filming this. So I'm just like speaking to my computer. Um, but I really like to get this video up. So I'm going to go ahead and just let it be what it is. <laughs> um, so let's see. So Typically, I start with doing um, the eye and maybe some of like the darker shadowy areas with my pen. I don't always start with this, but um, this is one of the circumstances where I did do that. And you can see that it's all in pencil right now. Um, I did the original sketch on my iPad just to get it looking how I wanted. And then I kind of used my iPad as a light box and I traced it onto this paper. Um, I'm working in a moleskin uh, watercolor sketchbook um, that my, or moleskine, I don't know how you say it, but um, my husband got this for me last year and I love this paper. Like I don't usually have preferences about paper. I'm not too picky about it, but I really, really like how my characters turn out when I use it. Um, if you're familiar with my work, um, the owl with like the baguettes is done on this. Um, Charles the sea otter, Wesley the river otter. So anyway, um, it's just like the perfect amount of rough and smooth for my taste. So you can see that I'm going in with um, some light colors, kind of like mapping out the more gray areas and the more tan areas, um, leaving some white spaces too. Um, just because these squirrels have like a very um, modeled, is it called grizzled? Grizzled fur? Um, why can't I think of what that's called? Well, anyway, it's 
it's a there's like a lot of like little white hairs and black hairs mixed in with the tan so I have to do a lot of layering to get this to be what I want it to be but I'm just kind of going in with like a base um, and I'm always leaving more white space um, then I might end up with in the end just so that I'm not filling something in too much. And the coloration varies on these California ground squirrels from like gray to golden to black to like this frosty white. So I'm just kind of switching in between colors and um, I decided to go ahead and fill out his belly because it is pretty much like a tannish golden color. And now I'm going in with a colored pencil for some of the hairs and now I'm back to watercolor. So you guys can see I just I use a lot of mediums um, for the technique that I want. I'm doing a second layer in the watercolor now. Um, and actually like if you wanted you could basically like stop with that level of detail. Um, but I just like to make the fur look pretty much as real as possible. I mean, I'm not doing something photorealistic, but I like to get a lot of texture. Um, that's just my taste for, for what I'm trying to achieve, but I love work that's just like, you know, a single stroke making something look amazing. But anyway, um, going in and adding this like darker gray because their cheeks are a little bit darker. And the important thing when you're painting fur is to do your strokes in the direction that the hair is growing. Um, that's gonna help show the form of the animal a lot. I feel like that's one of um, the mistakes I see. If I, I've seen before where people are trying to do something that looks realistic, but the fur is being drawn in a weird direction or their brush strokes are in a weird direction and so it's not having the right, like giving the volume and the form to the creature and it just doesn't look right. So you guys saw me go in with my, um, my white jelly roll and my pen and then layer watercolor over that. I'm gonna do that like multiple times and it's kind of ridiculous, but I just keep going until I'm happy. And I have a thicker white pen and a thinner white pen and I just alternate depending on what I wanna do. I've said before, I used to really be like a purist and think like I had to be able to complete the entire piece in just watercolor, but um, I've just learned that if I want to achieve a certain look, I have to be open to using multiple mediums and I can't um, be so strict with myself about it. So some of this is watercolor, some of it's gouache. Um, and it's not like necessarily a conscious choice of, oh, I'm working with this right now or I'm working with that, but my palette has both watercolor and gouache on it. And at this point, I'm not sure which blobs of paint are which uh, material. So um, until I start painting with them, then I can kind of figure it out sometimes. But anyway, going in and adding some more little white furs, they have like this frosted area across the back of their neck. Um, yeah, and filling in this and doing some strokes on the side body. The thing with, um, with watercolor is that you really do have to do a lot of layers in order to get like deeper, darker, uh, tones. Um, because if you just like mix up some black and you put it on the page, it's probably going to dry gray. And if you want it to be darker, you have to do more coats than that. Again, you just see me going crazy <laughs> with this pen. Um, this was one of the pieces where actually, like when I was probably at this point, I thought this is not gonna look good. I'm not gonna be happy with it. Um, and it's one of those trust the process things, you know, you think like, oh my gosh, this is horrible. And if you keep pushing yourself and you keep going, you know, then it, it gets to a good point. Now I'm doing another layer of watercolor over that after the uh, jelly roll ink has dried. If you do it while it's still wet, it'll kind of blend, which I do use that to my advantage sometimes, but in this circumstance, I wanted more like um, individual lines to remain underneath the watercolor. I didn't want it to blend with it. 
I'm using a little bit of gouache in this part I can tell because it's a little bit more like opaque it has some white in it and um, this white watercolor isn't usually like a thing so uh, usually with your when you're just working with watercolor the areas that you want to be white are just going to be the plain paper and if you want something to be a light color you just water down the watercolor to to make it more translucent and show the white paper through but in this circumstance I wanted to go over a few things like over some of the dark areas and so I mixed some of the white gouache with um, I think I was working working with like an ochre ochre gouache I think like oh okay he's done <laughs> I was gonna say I think that when I'm working on it it just looks like I'm a crazy person um, but it turns out pretty good I think so I did not film painting the surfboard originally I did it in watercolor and then I ended up using an acrylic craft paint um, because I needed something that looked more solid like a solid object rather than like something translucent in front of him it just was like creating this weird illusion um, I added some sand which was my husband's idea um, using the white jelly roll and then doing a little wash of like a sandy color over it it's not perfect but I think that it gets the effect across thank you guys so much for watching I hope that you enjoyed this that you're doing well um, if you are in somewhere where it's summer or spring, I hope that you're enjoying getting outside. I know I am. Um, yeah, if you would like to um, get a print of this little guy, I know I am releasing this video absolutely last minute. Um, you can join my Patreon print club in the month of April, <laughs> so today, and get a print. But if I have a few left over, they're going to be in my shop. Um, it's $10 if you join my print club um, on Patreon. So you, you just join for $10 and then I send it to you. Um, and then they go in my shop for $20. Um, if you do want to join my Patreon and get the print and it's after April, um, my patrons can get those prints in my shop for 50% off. So they get them at the original patron price. Um, yeah, or you can just purchase, purchase the print in my shop when it's there. Um, yeah, I'm also um, working on my graphic novel. It is so challenging to work on a self-initiated project that is this long. <laughs> so um, I'm trying to keep up my motivation for that. There's certain pages I'm really enjoying illustrating and other ones where I'm kind of like threading. It's just challenging to get like you know, if I have a new scene that has a lot of like architectural elements, I'm not really that used to drawing things like that. Um, yeah, so I think it's just taking me a really long time and I, I need to get a little faster, but um, yeah. So if you're interested in any of that stuff, you can head over to my Patreon because they're funding the, gra the graphic novel project and the graphic novel tier actually gets to read the pages as I make them. So each month I release like five to 10 pages for them. And I think there's gonna be like a total of 45 after this month that are up and available. So yes, thank you so much for watching and I will see you guys later, bye.